Thank you. Okay, um, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Marissa Meyer. She was one of the um, earliest Google employees. In fact, I think you were the first female engineer over there. And she now runs uh, tremendous portions of the company, which she will all t uh, tell us about. Thank you very much for being here. Um, do you want this? I can also wire you. It's okay. Um, well, hello everyone. I'm sorry that I'm late. We had a meeting today, uh, an annual meeting that runs that ran about an hour over schedule, and then we hit traffic. So I apologize for being late. Um, but what I'd like to do is spend probably about 20 minutes just going over a quick talk and a, su a summary of some of the things that I think are really exciting in search at Google, and then spend the rest of the time uh, spending th that time on your questions. Uh, so I thought I would start off by giving you a little bit of background. Um, on my, on my background uh, and, and what, um, how I ended up at Google, and then an overview on some of the big problems and also some of the big drivers at Google that ultimately drive innovation. So start off with, um, I'm a geek. I've been a geek since I was little. This is me at age three. <laughs> You can see I was like made for Google, like right out of the box. <laughs> um, but uh, um, you know, I've always had pensions for bright colors, apparently, and white. The, um, this is the first computer that I bought. Uh, so growing up, I was always very good at math and science, and I thought that I would be a doctor. I wanted to be a neurosurgeon uh, because, because I was very interested in how the brain worked, and I saw my my uh, high school years babysitting, prolifically babysitting, and saved up all my money such that when I got to college, I bought uh, I bought this Centris 610, um, and it was so there. And you know, now having not been interested in computers at all, my freshman year of college, I became really interested in computers. Um, and while I really enjoyed the the biology and the chemistry that I was taking, I have to say I was really just electrified by the computer and a computer science course I took uh, from someone who ultimately became my mentor named Eric Roberts. Um, and that ultimately led me to look at changing my major from chemistry and biology to changing it to something called symbolic systems. How many of you here have heard of symbolic systems? Anyone? So symbolic systems is a, is a strange major they have over at Stanford. I know, boo, hiss. <laughs> um, but it's a strange major, but I have to say, it, it really captured a lot of my interest. Because what it does is it blends together cognitive psychology, how people learn, philosophy, how people reason, linguistics, how do people express themselves, um, and computer science. Can we teach a computer to do the very same thing? And so I did this as my undergraduate, mostly because I was really interested in computers and I didn't want to pick something that was super specialized. And then I went on to do a, um, a master's in computer science as well. But I think that I really loved how well-rounded this was. Well, I also really enjoy the engineering dis disciplines, I also think that, that having this approach to think about how do people learn and reason has been really helpful, especially in designing systems, uh, which is ultimately what we end up doing in product management. And so I think this background is really something that, that plays well to systems design and also interface design, but also played, as you can tell, to my interest in, neuro, in, in neuroscience and neurosurgery. Because I realized I was much more interested in figuring out how the brain worked than actually cutting up a brain. <laughs> and so, so this uh, major worked, ended up working really well for me. Along the way, I met uh, Professor Eric Roberts, who became my mentor. Eric encouraged me to teach at Stanford, and so I did some computer science, both section leading, uh, TAing, and then ultimately lecturing. Um, and he's also the person who put me in touch with Google, and we'll, we'll come back to that in, in a second. Um, I did some interesting research uh, along the way um, at the Research Institute, I, I'm doing various uh, models in artificial intelligence. And then I had one really interesting summer at a place called UbiLab. Uh, UbiLab was in Switzerland. It's the Union Bank uh, of Switzerland's research lab. Um, and what we were doing there was starting to experiment with the internet. This was the summer of 1998. The web was, you know, depending on how you measure it in, in, its, in its modern form, you know, somewhere on the order of you know, five years old or so. And we were looking at, could we build an interesting recommender system? Basically, could we take everyone's trail through the web for the day, which pages you visited, and analyze that in order to find interesting, relevant pages that the person hasn't looked at. So basically, a collaborative filtering algorithm, where if a person visits sites A, B, and C, and later someone goes ahead and visits site B, you can 
go ahead and recommend to that second user that maybe they want to see sites A and C. And if you actually start doing this over a large enough uh, set of data, you start to get really good information um, for, the, for the user in terms of finding something relevant. And the Union Bank was interested in this because they wanted their traders to be more efficient in the morning. What reports should they be looking at? And if you actually knew all the different reports that people were looking at, that ultimately helped inform the next trader what was key for that particular day. But then taking this research and coming back to Stanford, I ran into, into Eric Roberts, and he had actually hired me to teach for the first time that fall. And he said, well, tell me a little bit about your research for the summer. And so I told him about the overall web recommender. We were trying to build a system that would be built into a browser. So when you were browsing the web, you'd get recommended sites on the side. And he said, you know, that's really interesting, because there's these two guys on the fourth floor. And they're doing what you're doing, so they're not looking at where people go on the web. They're looking at the link structure of the web, but they're doing the same computation to try and understand which sites are important. And they're building a search engine using it. And he said, and they just dropped out to start a company, and I can't remember the name. And you know, it's Larry Page, Sergey Brin, like, you should look them up. And I said, you know, Eric, I just got back in the country, and I'm teaching for the first time, and I'm kind of stressed out, and I don't really have time to mess around with this startup. And I then promptly forgot all about it. <laughs> um, and then next spring, uh, about eight months later, as I was finishing out my job search, I got an email from Google uh, where they had gotten my name from some, some of my professors and said, we hear you're graduating. We think you should come talk to us. And when I, I hit the space bar instead of hitting delete, purely by accident due to a, a bowl of bad pasta. Um, and, uh, and I realized this was that company that Eric had talked to me about. So I went over and talked with Larry and Sergey, and at that time the whole company, which was seven people, uh, and tried to learn a little bit about what, what Google was doing. And I went there for two, ultimately decided to go there for two particular reasons. One, as I was looking at all of the different job opportunities out there, I realized, I started thinking about the best decisions I had made up to that point. And I think changing my major, working at UB Lab, doing that summer of research uh, in AI at, the, at SRI, um, those were all really good experiences. And I thought, well, what are they? Ha what, these are all very different decisions. It's really different. You know, how do you decide on a major versus how do you decide on an internship versus how do you decide to move to Switzerland when you don't speak the language for the summer? But I realized they had two common threads. And one of them was that I always tried to work with the smartest people I could find. Because I think when you work with the smartest people you can find, it elevates how you think about problems. It, it elevates how creative and, and, con and constructive your thinking is. And I really wanted that in whatever opportunity I ended up picking. And the other thing was that I, I think I th in each case I had done something I wasn't ready to do be it changing my major and trying to explain to my father what this major was, or moving to a country where I didn't speak the language. I think this is actually really, really important because that's when you stretch and that's when you grow and you learn new things about yourself. And Google was a classic example of that. Um, you know, I could hear, I could think, to, I was thinking to myself, well, I could go there, I could learn a lot about how to build a build a company and learn a lot about computer science, or it may be the brunt of all family reunion jokes when I'm 40. Because right? like, the name itself is almost like a punchline. I could hear my parents saying, when Marissa graduated, she went to, get this, Google. <laughs> um, but I think that when you look at these two criteria, it really, th th these for me really encapsulate what was really appealing about the, the opportunity to work at Google, which was basically to learn and really push myself to try and understand what types of things I was really interested in and what types of things that I'd be good at. Uh, and these are the early days of Google. That's, that's me there. Uh, my first task, actually, at Google wasn't, it had nothing to do with computer science at all. I actually, my, my first day, Paul Buchheit, who later became the, the inventor of, of Gmail, and I, we started within two days of each other. And we were given the task of hanging that vinyl sign that you see <laughs> up there on the top. So we had to go next door and borrow the bookstore's ladder and get some rope and like devise, it took us a while to devise how would we actually rig it up. Um, and, and it hung there, that was our, our Google office sign for about a month. This is the day that we moved out of that office. So this is about, uh, about six weeks after that. Um, but you can see it was a really a small company, it was a very fun company to work for. And everyone was really optimistic in terms of what we could do for the web and what we could do for search in terms of the overall quality and relevance. 
Uh, which brings me to my next point. I think that one of the key elements of Google is that we've always had a healthy disrespect for the impossible. Certainly there are tests out there, and, and search is one of them, where you're never going to get it 100% right. You're never going to get it absolutely perfect. But just not allowing yourself to think that way, not allowing you to th yourself to think that something's impossible, and just really pushing to see what can be accomplished or can be achieved, I think is important. And there's a few, a few different projects that embody that. Um, one was Google language tools. And I think that this is an, you know, people will, will look at this, and we actually offer um, our website in 173 local domains and languages. And people will say, you know, how does that work? You know, how many people at Google work on translating the website and translating the search engine? Um, and in the early days of Google, I'll just back up for a second. When we first rolled out, we were only in English. And but six months later, we thought, you know, we really should offer Google in different languages. So my first role at Google was to program on the Google web server, which is the piece of code that answers the requests that come in for search. Uh, and when we went to internationalize, it meant we had to stringify the web server, take all the different text that printed out on the results page, put it all into a file, package it up, send it to a translation house, the, that translation house found translators all over the world and, and that could do both the translation and the quality assurance of it. And they would do several iterations back and forth until they had the file finished. Then they would send it back to me, we would load it up, compile it, and launch a version of Google that was available internationally. Which that all sounds like a very good tidy process, right? To ultimately get a lot of different languages available for the website. The downside of that is, of course, you're a startup. And we, at that time, we, and, and even today, we're launching things all the time. The needs of the web server are always changing. There's always new strings that need to be translated, which means as the file is over there during that two-month period of actually getting all those strings translated, you know, 100 new things have shown up on the website where you need to have a little string here or a little string there. Uh, and so the code ended up riddled with if, else, to do's, comments all over to come back and take out all the different cases when a, a set of translations came back. So you can probably tell from my description of this, we were really losing our minds trying to manage the web server and keep it running in all of these different languages. And I have a friend, uh, his name is Alan, and he runs a website called The Weather Underground. And Alan, basic, Alan, I looked at it with The Weather Underground, and while well, his company had six people, they were offering The Weather Underground in 50 languages. And I said, you know, Alan, how are you doing this? Because you know you only have six people. How can you do 50 languages? Like we have, you know, a company of about 200 at that time, and it's killing us to do 14. And he said, well, you know, I just I just rely on on the users. I get all this these user fan mails that say like I am Weather Underground's number one fan in Bosnia. And he's like, and I just mail them back and say thanks. Do you speak Bosnian? Because if you do, and you can tell me how to say the following 400 words in Bosnian, I'll bring up your very own version of Bosnian Weather Underground. And sure, you know, so sure enough that they could translate Celsius and Fahrenheit and cloudy and rainy and all these different words, he would just bring up the site. And he said, certainly there's got to be people out there who are interested in helping out Google that way and helping bring the search engine to different countries. So we put together a little interface that allowed people to sign up and volunteer and translate the website. Basically a very early form of user-generated content uh, back in, in, in 2000. And we were amazed. Today we have more than a million volunteer translators who have signed up. We went from doing 14 languages to doing 173 languages. Uh, and you can see sort of like this type of orthogonal approach, that unexpected approach of, well, what if we actually have the users help us as opposed to doing it in the very traditional way that you would normally translate? Ultimately helps uh, really push past that as, and, and I think embodies the healthy disregard for the impossible. And the fun little Easter egg here uh, is that I did one of the translations uh, myself, which is called Bork, Bork, Bork. Uh, based on a utility, a Linux utility that I found when I was a graduate student. How many people here have tried using Chef? So if you type Chef at the uh, Linux prompt, it actually will, in, on most systems, it will throw your computer into a strange mode where you can type English words and they, it will echo back to you as if it was spoken by the Swedish Chef Muppet. <laughs> so if you type banana, it comes back and says bonuna. And if you say, like, I'm feeling lucky, it says, like, I'm feeling lucky. 
and like it, it spells these all out phonetically. And so because I didn't speak any other languages and I needed to test the system, I used a dialectizer and actually created a version of the website. Sent it out to the company and said, you know, hey guys, this is what it would look like if the Muppets ran the place. And they thought it was so funny that we should actually put it on the website so you can see it listed here. <laughs> if you want to go and see this today, you can, you, can, you can see it. And because the Google interface is so simple and because you can sound out a lot of what the Swedish chef is saying, we actually have more than a million page views on any given day of the search engine of people using Bork, Bork, Bork. Because I'm able to set their, their language that way and keep it that way <laughs> over time. But a little, little Easter egg. Uh, I think that the other thing that's been really interesting is, for me, just the overall scale of Google. I think that um, when we, I look at back at those early days of growing the website, you know, even when we were handling hundreds of thousands of searches a day or a million searches a day, the way that your code gets tested when it's running at scale and it's literally being tested thousands of times per second is really amazing. And I would encourage, especially people who are in school, to look at systems, large systems courses, um, as well as managing huge amounts of information. At the time, you know, when I was in school, it was managing, managing gigabytes. Now it's probably something that more like managing petabytes or managing exabytes. But I think that working on how to handle scale, because there's just so much information in the world today, and the, and the software that we have that's going to be really impactful is going to end up getting run thousands of times per second and needs to really account for all these different cases. I think that the overall scale piece is something that is really important um, in terms of building companies and building some of these systems and something that I would encourage. Certainly, I learned a lot about scale at Google, but I think that it was a missed opportunity to not learn more about scale uh, uh, while I was in school. Um, and then I think this is something that I would not have, for, I would not have foreseen. Um, but Google Maps is another case, I would argue, of a healthy disrespect for the impossible. If you had said, you know, Google Maps launched just four short years ago, but if you had said, you know, four years ago, there's going to be an interactive tool that allows you to see satellite imagery and imagery from the street view of, of cars that have been driving by that we're basically we're going to try and create a mirror of the physical world and try and get that to be as real time as possible such that you could actually navigate the world and see how buildings are changing and how the landscape is changing. Um, I would have thought it, was, it wasn't possible. But I think that you can see that by really trying to design systems at scale, having that healthy disrespect for the impossible, even though it's not perfect, you can come, you can come really, really close. Uh, and I think that it's amazing to think about the fact that as little as five years ago, very few people had seen satellite images at all. Right? Maybe you saw satellite images on the news of a particular, of a particular place. But now most people, how many people here have seen a satellite image of somewhere where they've lived? Now that ha wouldn't have happened, five years ago that wasn't even possible. And it gives you the idea around having that healthy disregard for the impossible and really pushing the bounds of, of what can be done. Um, and then I thought I would quickly close by talking and then open up for questions about a few of the hard problems we're looking at in computer science. Um, for that, that relate to search. So in search, there's basically four key components. Relevance, do we have the results and are they ordered correctly? Comprehensiveness, do we have the results at all? Were we able to find something that relates to your query? The overall user experience and latency. Can you do it quickly? How much work and, and overhead is there in, in the overall operation? And I think that when you look at that, there's a few technologies that we're investing in that might be non-obvious, but I think are really exciting in terms of what they could do for search. One of them is Google Squared. How many people here have tried Google Squared? So why is this hard and why is this interesting? What we're basically trying to do is do reasoning on freeform data of the web at large and extract values and information and populate them in an automated way. So Google Squared, the name is a pun, um, because one, it produces a square output, but two, you're Googling your Google results. Because what we look, or look for here is, you give us a query that's maybe a class of things, like roller coasters. We take your Google results for roller coasters, and then we search and try and find the entities within them. And ba then we will populate a spreadsheet that for has an entity, one per row, and then has all of the high confidence data values we could pull out of that freeform data. Basically, we're looking at 
information and trying to understand what's a fact. What has the structure of a fact in that freeform data? And can that fact be verified on other web pages looking at their factual structure? And then can we take those facts and display them in a way that's ultimately useful for the user? And so depending on what you search for on Google Squared, you actually get different values in each case because you can do things, something like roller coaster and you get height, length, drop, speed, the type of construction, or you can do something like nearby star, which will tell you how hot it is, how big it is, what its name is, what kind of star it is. And this is all done in an automated way, which is really, really hard in terms of the technology. And again, it's, it is, this is something where it is impossible to be perfect here. But that said, it's still worth trying to see how far we can get, because it really could push our understanding of the information that's on the web forward in a way that could help us find and answer users' searches and their needs for information in entirely new ways. Because basically, if you can do this, you can also do all kinds of interesting comparison charts, you can, and you can apply it to almost, almost any genre. Uh, we also have been looking at natural language search and, and speech to text. And we have a Google Voice search that's been released. But the idea here is today in search, we're fairly remedial in that what you can express to the search engine is keywords, words that will appear on the pages that you're looking for. In the future, wouldn't it be nice if you could actually converse with the search engine? You could actually express yourself and your question to it the same way you might to a friend. And we would ultimately figure out what this means and then go and find the relevant data. Um, but I think that this is something that's, that's really important in the context of search because we think that search will grow and expand over time. Uh, and one of the ways it will grow and expand is because we'll allow people and we'll enable people to do searches in ways they haven't been able to do in the past. Maybe they can do it from their phone. Maybe they can do it from their phone using, using a voice command. Or maybe you can just sit at your computer and just talk to it and have it bring back relevant information. But the more convenient we make search and the more multimodal we make search, the more search will ultimately be done because people will be able to go after those types of, of information needs that they might otherwise have just let, uh, have just let slip. Um, <laughs> this is an, an interesting uh, piece. We've been looking a lot uh, at images and image recognition. Can we figure out what's a face? Can we figure out what's a line drawing? And some of these are easier problems to approach, and some of them are, are more solved than others. But one thing that's happened that I'm particularly excited about uh, is we've been adding, this is some of, these are some of the, the functionalities we already have available, we've been adding a way to find similar images. And this kind of goes to that new way of searching because we think that that will ultimately expand how many searches are done. What we've done here is you, we've added a find similar images link to each picture. And you may say, well, you know, that doesn't seem that hard. It's not that hard to find similar images. But this technology, what it does is it tries to really find something that you know, maybe it's in daylight, maybe it's vibrant. Maybe, you know, in this case, if you search for a tiger, do you want a picture of a tiger from the side, from the front, with a cub, in daylight? How do you actually want to see them? And if you try and think about what type of query would you give us in keyword form, it's really hard to think of what query you would get, give us in order to say, look for lions from the side, facing to the right, standing a certain way. But you can then click on that and express this really complicated search. You can see, the, and, then, and then ultimately pick an image that's exactly what you're looking for. And then we, I'm excited by this because this is one of the first ways we've found to really help people richly express what they're looking for. Uh, you know, one, I think one of my goals is the omnivorous search box a search box where you can give it anything, be it an audio stream or a picture or a text, uh, a string of text, and we'll find something rele relevant to it and say something intelligent uh, about it. And I think this is the first example of how that might be able to work. Uh, and then another one of the, the difficult computer science problems I think is really relevant to search 
is machine translation. So before we talked about human translation and how we're using that to offer our site in a worldwide and global way, but another thing that we've been investing in, I think that people find puzzling, is machine translation. Because we've been investing a lot in machine translation over recent years. And we now have machine translation available in 50 different languages and all pairs of, which include really difficult translations like to in and out of symbolic languages like Korean or Japanese or Chinese. It also includes right to left languages and even includes the difficult pairings of things like right to left languages to symbolic languages and back. Uh, but the idea here, people say, why are we so interested in machine translation? But the idea here is, if we have great machine translation, we can help people find answers and find information, no matter what language it's in, wherever it is in the world. Uh, and it can really have a wonderful multiplication effect uh, in terms of finding information. So what do we do? This is, a this is our very first offering of it. It's called Clear um, Cross Language Information Retrieval. And here you have to pick your, your different languages. What language are you searching in? What language would you like searched? But later you could imagine us expanding this and doing it across all languages in an automatic way. But the idea here, here is that you type in a search, you tell us what language it's in, we translate it into your target language, search the web for that phrase, that translated uh, phrase, get those results, back, and of course they come back in, in this case, French, and then we translate it back, showing you results here in your own native language. So even though we searched the French web for the answers for Bordeaux tastings, you're actually reading them here in English. And you might say, well, that's not particularly useful because now I've got a list of French pages that I can't read. But of course, when you click on these, we can invoke machine translation again and ultimately translate your results. So the web can operate. You can search it. You can operate in it. You can read it as if it was all written in your native language. And for some, like, some languages, like Arabic or Korean, where very small percentages, less than 1% of the web is written in their native language. This just explodes the amount of content that's there and available. And in terms of search, this means that there's a good answer that's available anywhere on the web, regardless of what language it's written in, we can find it and help provide it to our users. Uh, Google Book Search is another is another thing that we've been working on. How many people here have used Google Book Search in, in school? It's funny because we can totally see that in our traffic. I was just looking at the traffic trends today because when school comes back on, you can see Google Books and Google Scholar both get a lot more use. Uh, but I have to say, you know, I'm really inspired by Google Book Search. I think this not only is a difficult computer science problem, but it's also the healthy disregard for the impossible. When we were small, Larry and Sergey said, "How come we can't?" Just find, why, why are we so focused on web pages? Web pages are great, but they take minutes or hours to create. What about books that take man years to write and edit and produce? Why can't we search those? Uh, and it wasn't until many years later when we actually had enough people that we could pursue uh, Google Book Search. But the idea here, of course, is to scan the world's books and make them all online and searchable, which is part of our core mission, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. But this is a not, it's not obvious that this problem could be, could be um, dealt with this way. Could you scan books? Could you actually do that in enough volume? Would OCR technology make it possible to extract the text from those photographs, making them searchable? And a, and a fair amount of different trends all had to come together at that moment, that moment in, two, in 2003 and 2004 when we first started this, to work. One, high enough resolution photography available and mass enough that we could build scanning machines that use standard components to gather these images. And then, basically working on the OCR technology so we could extract the text and make it searchable. And then, of course, then there's the, the negotiation with the publishers to be able to offer this content on their terms and respectful of the copyright owners in a way that people can see what's in the book or get a snippet of the book and find out what's relevant and then hopefully be able to browse the book. But we're really excited about this project and what it could mean in terms of being able to find information. My last observation before I open for questions is that a lot of people talk about 80-20 problems, where the first 20% of the work yields you 80% of the solution. And that's true with a lot of problems in computer science. Um, and with search, I really think of it, it's like the 80-20 problem, but it's actually a 90-10 problem. And what I mean by that is, 
Right now, we have a good 90% solution. You can go to Google, you can type things in. A lot of the time, you'll get back something useful. And if you don't, you're, you can be pretty confident that the right answer might not be out there. But I actually think that when you think about the future of search, what could happen if we had great machine translation? What could happen if you could talk to the search engine? What could happen if it was more personalized or answered you in a way that was more rich and, and, and multimodal? I think that then you can imagine how far search can really come. And I think that we really have just scratched the surface here. And that that last 10% of making search really convenient and work for everyone is 90% of the work. And I think it will actually advance us beyond where we think the endpoint is today into something that's just really, really amazing in terms of the convenience and user experience it can offer. So thank you. And with that, I'm open for questions. Yeah, here. Um, I think in terms of the, the overall research split, it's pretty interesting. I would say that everyone at Google thinks it's their role to innovate. I think that there are, there, one company approach would be to say, well, you know, there's a research division and they're doing all the innovation, they're doing all the far out thinking. And that's not the way that we think about it at Google. We think everyone should be trying to think of what's the next big thing, thinking further out. Uh, and so it's much more fluid. There are some people who tend to be more academic in their approach and want to be, focus more on research. That said, that isn't, that our, our usual software engineers who are working on search every day or machine translation or Gmail every day are also thinking about how to innovate. And I actually see quite frequently people sort of flipping one way or the other, right? Someone will say, well, I really want to go off and research and think about this more in sort of our classic 20% time model. At the same time, I've also had research scientists say, you know what, I really, you know, when people come to work at Google, one of the reasons they'll come is because their friends use it and their mom uses it and they want to have something out there that's tangible. Uh, and so, you know, some of the research scientists I've worked with, Krishna, Bay, they'll say, well, you know, research is fun and all, but like I want to put something out there that Google users use. And so Google News was, was done by Krishna Bharat, who was one of our, our early research scientists. Uh, Bei Wei Chang was one of the people who worked really hard on the Gmail interface. Uh, and a lot of the, the ideas around the design, the threading, some of the interactivity were his. And so it gives you an idea that it's really, it is really fluid and it is a partnership. And we try not to compartmentalize innovation. We think that if you compartmentalize innovation to say, oh, well, innovation happens over there. It just doesn't happen in the way it really should, certainly in a technology company. Other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, I think that there's uh, there are a few key observations that I would make there. Um, one is that the oops, sorry, thanks. One one is that um, in the beginning, all design and all vision starts with instinct, right? You have an instinct. This is a problem that might want to be solved. There could be a good solution to this problem. Um, and so you oftentimes are listening to your own vision. But then we do a few things that I think really help shape the product. One is that we dog food the product, which means we all start using it at Google because that way there's a lot of people, you know, computer scientists often to be, tend to be pretty tolerable of different type beta bugs, all of that, but also pretty insightful about what works and what doesn't. So we'll do dog fooding. We'll also do very basic user, user tests where people will come in, we'll put eight or 10 people through using the product to see, can they understand it? Does it make sense? Is it designed well? Um, and then from there, we'll launch it and then we get actual real time user feedback where the people you know, are able to use it. If it's on Google Labs or experimental, we actually have them emailing us in feedback directly. But we're also looking at usage patterns to try and understand what's useful about this product, what's helpful, how can we improve on that, what's the next feature to build. And I will say that even when we were small and we couldn't necessarily afford to do a lot of testing and or do a lot of split A-B experiments where you try something new with just a small percentage of users, 
even in those early days, it's still the case that there's a lot of data out there. I think that one of the things I learned from symbolic systems was cognitive psychology, and there's a ton of research. What fonts read the best? How do people respond to colors? What's the best spacing between lines for readability versus scannability? Uh, all of that type of data, uh, of data exists. In fact, when I, you know, as I said, my background is AI, and I very quickly at Google I was doing AI, but I ultimately started switching over to sort of more HCI design type work. And I think that, the, you know, when I was when Urs Hotsley, my boss at the time, asked me to do that, he said, "What we need is data. We don't need more opinions." And I thought, "Well, well, how am I going to get data, right?" But it was interesting to go back and say, "Well, at the time, Google had serif fonts." Did that make sense? Should, it have, should the fonts have serifs or not? And clearly, I couldn't run a really expensive test that help us understand whether or not to do serif fonts or not. But there's a ton of research out there that covers that type of information and ultimately helped us make decisions. So I think the answer is it has to be organic for each, for each product. Um, and you kind of have to go with the flow. But that said, there is always some data to help you verify your instinct, be it through your colleagues using the product, through existing research, or through research you go in and get yourself. OK, well, I don't want to run too much over. And I want to thank all of you for your time. So.